I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files, true stories of encounters with Bigfoot. August 20th, 1986, Lincoln County, Wyoming. My friend was from Kemmerer and was interested in showing me where he and his family had hunted virtually his entire life. We were both 21 years old, and I can honestly say in the best shape of my life. We had breakfast at his parents' house that morning, had no alcohol of any kind before arriving at the location. We arrived at the base of a mountain in the area at approximately 11 a.m. It was a beautiful day, approximately 55 degrees and sunny. I had just purchased a new Ford truck, and we parked in a clearing about a third of the way up the side. We climbed to the top from there, arriving at the top about 1 p.m. We walked for the rest of the day. We were purposely being as quiet as possible the majority of the time in order to see as much wildlife as possible. We came upon elk and moose during the afternoon. We were making a large loop down the side of the mountain and back to the truck. The loop was approximately nine miles. About 5 p.m., it became clear that we were not going to be at the truck before dark as it was getting darker by the minute. About 7.30 p.m., we were getting close and we only had to cross a small stream that was about a half mile from the truck. By the time we crossed the stream, it was dark. The moon was rising and providing some light. What comes next, I have only told to certain family members for fear of being ridiculed. If it had not happened to me, I don't know if I would believe it either. When we crossed the stream, we were in thick brush and trees. As we came out of the brush and into the clearing, we saw the truck about 500 yards away. It was visible in the moonlight. We talked we talk quietly about where we had been and where he and his dad would most likely concentrate on hunting. As we got closer to the truck, approximately 400 yards, I saw some movement by the truck. I could not tell what it was, but it was a brand new truck and I was concerned that someone may have been trying to break into it. My friend saw the movement at about the same time as me. We decided to be as quiet as possible and sneak up to the truck. I had a Smith & Wesson 357 and my friend a 44 Ruger. We were not afraid at that time, but we were soon to be. As we came up to about 200 yards, I could tell in the moonlight that the movement was from an upright figure. I initially thought that it was a human, but something was odd. I could not understand that if someone was trying to get into it, why they weren't being more forceful. As we came to about 75 to 100 yards, I could hear the sound of the metal of the truck being bumped up against, much as you would hear if you put your hand down on the hood or the side of the door or something. At this time, we both knew that there was definitely someone we were going to encounter. I was a little scared coming up on someone like this. I thought if someone wanted the truck and they were also armed, what would happen? Neither one of us wanted to confront someone with the prospects of shots being fired or anyone getting hurt. We continued to slowly stalk our way up to the truck without muttering a word to each other for fear of being heard. We still continued to see movement around the truck, but we could tell there was more than one individual. When we were approximately 40 feet from the truck, I could not believe what I saw. Not two, but three creatures. Two large and one smaller. The larger ones were roughly six and a half feet tall, and the smaller about five feet. I could immediately tell they were not human, because I could distinguish that they were covered in hair and not clothed. We were stopped dead in our tracks at this point, not knowing what to do for about three seconds. They looked similar to one another. Their shoulders were wide and their necks seemed to be shorter than that of an average human, although I have seen people on occasion with similar shaped necks. I could tell that their hands were larger than average, and their arms were longer than normal. All three were muscular, but in a compact way. Not at all like an Olympic athlete. At this time, everything happened so fast. They all three saw us about the same time and bolted away from us. It was too dark to distinguish facial features, even in the moonlight, but I could tell one of the larger ones was looking right at us just before they all ran. When they ran, we ran towards the truck. Although they all three ran in the same direction, the two larger ones ran slightly away from directly towards the rising moon. I estimate it was about 30 degrees above the horizon. 
The clearing was large, and I could clearly see the smaller one that was running almost directly towards the moon. When this happened, I could see the individual very clearly. I have always thought of the creatures as individuals because they did not behave in the way that normal wild animals would. They were so curious around the truck, not like anything I have ever seen before or since. They meant no harm to us or even the truck. The smaller one that I saw at the closest distance was on a dead run. The gate was upright and almost leaning back. I have seen large football players almost have this same type of running position. The body was totally covered in thick hair. I could tell the color was dark brown, not totally black. Before I knew it, I was fumbling with my keys trying to get into the truck. At this moment, I was really in disbelief and nervous, but not scared. As soon as I got my door opened and opened the other side, I started up the truck. My friend said the first words we had spoken to each other since we were just into the clearing. He said, We can't tell anyone about this. I didn't say anything. I had the truck coming down the side of the hill as fast as I could. He was always scared of my driving, but did not say another word until we got to the bottom. Summer, 1993 or 1994. Redwood National Park, Oric, Humboldt County, California. I had been riding horses with three other friends on the six-hour loop trail and stopped for lunch where the outhouse is located at the one-day trail junction. We were all sitting at the picnic table having lunch and was hearing much crashing in the brush. Not unusual sounds, for there are elk everywhere in the park. We did notice, however, that a bear or something had an awfully good time with the outhouse toilet paper, as it was strung all over the place. We're all sitting there having lunch, and I decided that I wanted to see where the elk were, maybe see a big bull. So I got on my horse and rode down to where I heard the noise. The trail is cut out on an old logging road, and a creek crosses through a culvert to the other side of the road, and the water forms a small pool before moving on down into the larger creek below. I could not tell how long I was sitting there on my horse, watching this creature, not more than 30 feet away, trying to get a drink of water out of the pool. It was a challenge as the sides of the pool were fairly steep. At first I thought it was a man, then a monkey, and at last my brain registered what I was looking at. Then I seen the fingernail. It was black and human-like. I was looking at an adolescent, possibly baby Bigfoot. It never had a chance to turn and to look at me, as the horse I was on kept getting more and more upset the longer that I stayed there. I ran back on my horse to my friends and told them in a stuttered manner what I had seen. Just by the way I was acting, they knew something was up, because I had been in the woods on horseback almost half of my life. They immediately followed me back to the area, where I had seen what I described as a young adolescent Bigfoot. My friends did not ever see the creature, but they heard it as it walked away and seen the ferns moving as it rustled through them on its way down the hill to the larger creek. Never heard any sounds from him or her. My friend was going to follow, and I cautioned her because I believed that Mum was close by. The crashing in the brush we heard was not made by the adolescent-looking creature. It was made by something much larger. The creature was silver-gray, had medium-length hair, like a bear, black human-like fingernails, human-like hands. I seen its thumb. Was totally covered in hair from top to bottom. I never got to see its face. It was always looking down. I never told anyone about the sighting and made my friends promise not to say anything for quite a while. I explained that this was a young animal and to allow me to get this close was inexperience. And if I could get that close on a horse then someone could get that close with a gun. It was not long after that there was a news report about a son and a father seeing a Bigfoot cross the road near Prairie Creek State Park. The news report was within a couple of weeks of my sighting, but still I kept my sighting to myself. August 11, 1990, Giles County, Virginia. My girlfriend had come to town for the weekend, and we had gone up to the abandoned fire tower on Butt Mountain to go hiking and camping for the weekend. We arrived there early on a Saturday morning, and set up our tent and did some exploring around the campsite, since it was her first time there. I had been to this site camping earlier in the spring with some other friends. When we got back to the campsite, 
We found that a group of students from Virginia Tech had arrived and had set up their tents on the other side of the clearing from us. We spent the afternoon exploring below the cliffs to the west of our campsite. There were some openings in the cliff face there, and we had noticed that they were full of trash dumped from the campground area above. We had seen quite a few deer in the area, but no signs of anything bigger. Around five or six, we came back to our tent and started to make something for dinner. We had brought some Italian sausages and were cooking those on our camp stove. While my girlfriend was cooking, I was watching the now-drunk college students goofing off below the cliffs around the opening I had mentioned before. As I was watching them, I noticed some movement in the trees across the gap. I just caught a glimpse of something dark moving down the hill through the trees. Thinking it was a bear, I moved further behind the bush beside me so I could watch it without being seen. It seemed to take forever moving down the hill. I would keep thinking it had gone off in another direction, then would see a dark patch in the break in the trees. Finally, it walked into a larger break in the trees and was walking on two legs. That's when I realized I was seeing a Bigfoot. It had not noticed me through the bush in front of me. Its attention seemed to be on the noisy college students below me on the cliff, and it was blocked from their view by the trees and bushes. The creature seemed to be a dark brown color, but it was in the shade of the trees, so I could not be 100% certain of its color. It was covered with long hair. I could see hair maybe four or five inches long hanging from its left arm clearly. The face area looked dark, but less hairy, kind of like a thin beard in places. I was probably 100 to 125 yards away, but I would guess the height was around six and a half feet by the height of the bush beside it. Its body was wide at the shoulders like a football player with shoulder pads on. The body was muscular, but tapered in size from down towards the waist and hips. As the creature was watching the campers, it squatted down and was moving side to side, like it was peeking through openings in the bushes and trees, trying to follow the action of the campers. Several times it seemed to raise its head as if to sniff the air. I watched the creature watching the campers for probably three to four minutes, then it must have realized I was there, and it turned to look towards me. When it turned, I could see it had no neck and had to turn its entire upper body towards me. As soon as it saw me, it froze for maybe five to ten seconds. At this point, I could see the eyes were very dark and large looking. The nose looked more flattened than a human nose, but not exactly like an ape. The face seemed egg-shaped, with strong looking jaws. I could not see much detail in the mouth or lip area. After this, the creature moved behind some bushes and was blocked from my view, so I moved out from behind the tree I was at and moved forward some. I was hoping to get another glimpse of it, but only managed to see patches of something dark through breaks in the trees as it headed back up the hill on the other side. About this time, my girlfriend came up behind me and asked where the bear went. She had only caught a glimpse of something dark and figure I was just watching a bear. She wanted to know if it might come back that night and bother us. Since I didn't want to scare her, I didn't tell her that it wasn't a bear until the next day after we packed the car and headed down the mountain. I didn't hear anything around the campsite that night except the students camping nearby and they were up most of the night partying. I guess I should tell you, until I moved from Virginia three years ago, I had spent most of my free time in the woods camping or hiking. I grew up exploring the wilderness on my own and also with the Boy Scouts. I have a master's in biology and I'm well aware of what bear and all the other native animals to this area look like. Fall, 1988, Throckmorton County, Texas. I have been an outdoorsman all my life. A reptile hunter has always been one of my hobbies so I can say when I'm out at night with my spotlight looking for snakes in the desert along cuts, arroys, or canyons, I have to make sure what I'm looking at, because I could step on a rattler or other dangerous critter. This happened to me one night in 1988. A friend of mine had a deer lease up by Throckmorton and wanted me and my brother-in-law to go with him to set up camp. Upon arrival, we went through the gate, picked a good spot in the clearing, and removed the trailer camper from his truck. We started a fire, had a few beers. After we all got our wind back, our one friend said he was going to bed, as he had to set up his feeders in the morning and scout for deer. 
me and my brother-in-law decided to take the topic maps and go explore the many ponds around to try and catch bullfrogs or see what we could find. The first pond had a few, but we decided to go to a bigger one down the trail a bit. Since we had mag lights before we left camp, our friend warned us about the game warden seeing us using lights out on a deer lease. Anyway, we started to walk to the other pond following the topic. Anyway, we started to walk to the other pond following the topic maps that we had. We had gone about a quarter mile when we noticed something hiding behind a tree. Me and my in-law stopped, saying, what the hell is that? At first we thought it to be the game warden. We had our lights right on it, standing like a human looking around the tree at us. We decided to get a little closer. It didn't move. My in-law said, whistle at it. So I did. I whistled twice. Upon that, it stepped right out in the road. We're talking a four-foot sidestep. I had seen some men before, but this was one strong one. I'm six foot, and it was seven or a little bit more. Heavy eyebrows, yellow eyes with red in them. The mid-body was short compared to the legs, which were long, arms down to the kneecaps. Covered in light hair, head was gray hair. No hairy creature like you are here. This was one lean machine, like a cougar is. I mean, we were close enough, I could see the muscles on this man. Anyhow, it started to walk for us. It took about two or three steps. I mean, four footsteps. Not in a run, but in a walk. I told my in-law I'm running. He was in shock, staring at the thing. I hit him in turn and said, come on. He was running backwards with his light on it. I told him, come on. We made a quarter mile in seconds flat, knocked on our friend's camper door wanting the gun, telling him this thing was right behind us. He wouldn't give it to us, saying we saw a deer or cow and closed the door to the camper. Me and my in-law were sleeping by the fire that night, and we wanted to make sure it was gone. So I got a hoe and we got a bushwhacker, and we went back to the area we saw it to make sure it was gone. We saw no sight of it again, so we went back to camp. The next morning, we did the deer thing with our friend as he laughed at us the rest of the trip. My in-law won't even talk about it, not even to me. I know what I saw. I have seen cougar, badger, deer, and many others in the night with lights. It was human. I wouldn't have shot it if I had a gun. It didn't want to hurt us, or it could have caught us easy. It seemed curious, as we were of it. There was a noise like a thumping, or something I can't explain, it was gone when we went back, too. It's been ten years or more, but I remember it like yesterday. Never reported it because I thought he should be left alone. Close Encounter near Peace River, Alberta. September 10, 1975. Drove to 12-foot Davis gravesite picnic grounds in Peace River with friend. We walked up the hillside behind the gravesite. No birds were chirping. Everything was silent. Hairs on my neck were standing up. I chose to go to outside toilet facilities. Friend moved back to the car. When I got about two feet from washroom door, I saw a shadow move, and I heard heavy outgoing of breath, and there was a musky stench. The toilet facilities were about eight to nine feet high of a pyramid shape. This thing was standing beside the toilet, and I estimate its height of at least seven to seven and a half feet high. I felt eerie and decided to forget the washroom trip. I started to walk away toward the gravesite. My friend yelled at me to get back in the car as he had been looking in my direction. I turned and looked behind me and felt immediate terror. This thing wasn't a bear, was on its front arms with bum up in the air and pushing itself along in an ambling fashion, following me about four feet away, and appeared to be sniffing at me. It was light-haired, dark blondish color. Looked not like a bear, had sparse hair on its body, more hair on legs and arms, ape-like face with little hair on the face, more on the head. Hair looked extremely coarse, almost like a horse's mane in winter. I quickly ran to the car. We jumped in the car and sped away around a corner and down the hill. As we were speeding away, this thing rose up and tried to chase the car a short way. It was angry, standing straight, not like a bear, 
more like a human. It was swinging its arms and screaming. We barely got away from it. It followed us down the hillside a short way. When I came home, I was so upset that I told my mother. She in turn passed this information on, and someone went up there the next day but didn't see anything. They found tufts of hair, but that was it. It has been 30 years, and I still have the details of what I saw stuck in my head, and I imagine I always will. A person does not survive that kind of terror without remembering it for the rest of your life. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator Cindy Dawson. I had a lengthy conversation with this witness, and I had found her to be credible. This incident occurred in 1975 when she was 18 years old. She says that her boyfriend, who was there with her at the time of the incident, is now deceased. She recalled driving up to the location with him on a late September evening, 6.30 to 7 p.m., for a walk. They strolled over to a lookout point and were walking back to their car when she decided to stop and use the ladies' room. She heard a deep breath and exhale within 20 feet of the facility. She assumed it was a bear, so she started to back up slowly as if there was a bear in the brush. She could then see an upright animal standing next to the washroom. Her boyfriend was parked no more than 30 feet away. He saw the animal and said to her, Get into the car now. When she looked back at the animal, it was five to six feet away from her, down on all fours and sniffing the air behind her. It was crawling in an awkward position with its rear end up in the air, like kids do when crawling on their hands and straight-legged. Due to how close the witness was to the subject, she was able to report a lot of detail. Its hair was a copper blonde color. It had more hair on its limbs than on its body and less on its ape-like face than on its head. She described the hair to be coarse like that of a horse's mane. Once she got into the car, the animal stood up on two legs, started a loud screeching sound, and went into an angry fit as the vehicle drove away. November 2003, near Longview, Alberta. A friend and I were out hunting south of Longview, Alberta. We had tried our luck up a road called the Indian Graves, but saw nothing, so we headed back to the main road going south. As we were heading south, we rounded a kind of bend in the road. We got around the corner, and there was a hillside on the right. The tree line started at the bottom of the hill and ended halfway up the hill with two pine trees at the very top. My buddy all of a sudden said, What's that thing up there? I was driving, so I took a quick glance and there was a large black thing standing between the pine trees at the top of the hill. I started to slow down and pull over when this thing went from the top of the hill in two feet of snow to the tree line in about three seconds. I'm guessing the distance to be about a hundred yards. We watched it in the trees for about one minute, and then it disappeared. We both agreed that whatever it was, was walking on two feet. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator Blaine McMillan. For privacy reasons, I'll refer to the witness as John. On the 5th of May, 2007, I talked to John and I found him to be a highly credible witness. John is a very avid and successful hunter. He and his hunting partners are very familiar with the area, as they have harvested many types of wild game near the place where this sighting occurred. John explained that game animals are often spotted along the hills and ridges that parallel the roads. It was his partner's job to monitor these hills as they drove from one hunting location to another. When John's partner spotted something moving on a ridge to the left, he slowed and stopped the vehicle. From the inside of the truck, the two hunters watched a large, upright, bipedal creature walk down the slope and into the safety of some brush. John stated that it covered a distance of close to 100 yards in a short amount of time, despite the fact that the snow was close to 5 feet in depth. John exited the vehicle and steadied himself across the hood of his truck so he can inspect the brush with his binoculars. Over the next minute, he could see what appeared to be a Sasquatch moving around in the thicket. He described the head as being connected to the body with no neck. The hair covering its body was black in color and varied in length over parts of its body. John said that it appeared to be very muscular and well-proportioned, except the arms were longer than normal. 
After a minute, he could no longer see it moving in the trees, and he and his partner returned to their vehicle. It was at this time that they tried to deduce what they had just seen. As seasoned hunters, they both knew that what they had seen could not have been a bear, and if it was a hunter, he would have been wearing blaze orange and would have been carrying a weapon. Neither of these were observed. The witness did not hear any vocalizations, nor did he detect any odors. However, as he did not see the animal leave the thicket, he felt that it was still hidden there when he and his hunting partner drove away. April 7, 2004, near Grand Prairie, Alberta. I was working as an emergency medical responder in the oil field, sitting on site for a gas well workover near the western edge of Red Rock Road. The job was ending due to spring breakup and road bands were partially on, preventing the moving of heavy loads during the day. At this time, the partial bands allowed heavy haul from midnight to 7 a.m. My consultant had directed that I be the last personnel to egress. The last low boy on site was having issues with tie-downs and that delayed his departure from location until approximately 3.30. Everyone else had been off site by 1 a.m. I held at location for 20 minutes past the last truck's departure, hoping he would stay far enough ahead of my medical unit to avoid it being peppered by rocks and frozen mud chunks. Meaning, I entered the red rock at approximately 4 a.m., heading in an easterly direction. I had been on site since 7 a.m. the previous day and was going into my 21st hour of being awake. Because of this, I was being extra careful to pay attention to both sides of the road maintaining a speed of about 30 to 40 kilometers per hour, hoping to give me enough reaction time to break for wildlife popping out on the road in front of me. There was a fair amount of wildlife in this area. Deer, elk, lynx, moose, black bear, and I even encountered a grizzly sow raising grass in a ditch by the side of the road in this area the summer before. My mobile treatment center was mounted on the bed of a 2500 Dodge Ram 2004 extended cab pickup being powered by a Cummings diesel. I was keeping the high beams on, the lights were illuminating the entire roadbed, the snow ice berm, and out another 10 meters on both sides of the road. I remember passing the area where the service rigs camp had been set up to the left of the road, thinking it looked pretty empty and deserted. I could make out the area because of the ambient starshine that, along with the last few centimeters of snow on the ground, helped give shape and shadow to the snow berms, stumps, trees, and gravel patches of the parking area of the camp. A few kilometers past the rig campsite, the Red Rock does a gentle S-curve through a stand of mature timber running along both sides of the road for approximately 500 meters. After this, the Red Rock comes out on a flat area where a road, Beaver Road branched out from the right heading south. From there, a graded left curve dropped into a wide arc at about a 4% grid to cross a single lane temporary bridge over a creek. After crossing the bridge, the road swung in an arc to the right, climbing back up out of the creek's floodplain again at about 4% grade. I'm pretty short, 5 foot 2 and occasionally, if the grade was steep enough, I would not be able to see the road directly in front of my rig until I started to level out. Because of this, I had slowed to about 20 kilometers per hour. As I topped the hill coming up out of the creek, I was just about to accelerate when a solid five-point elk came from the right side of the road, hopping over the berm and landing not four feet in front of my fender. Scared the stuffing out of me. Breaking hard, I was glad I had slowed down. I then notice the condition of the elk. He takes about two steps, coming to a full stop right in front of my rig. Looking closer at the elk, I can see that he's winded. His nose is up, almost like he's going to bugle. His antlers are laying almost parallel to the line of his back. His tongue is hanging out the side of his mouth, where it is clearly visible to me, and the eye I can see is rolled back, exposing the sclera. I'm thinking, what the heck, it's not rut. Why would this animal be acting like this? The elk stood there for three to five seconds, panting, then dropping its head into a normal walking position. He walked slowly off to the left side of the road. My experience with elk and deer and roads has always been, if there's one, there are usually more, 
So before I started forward again, I did a check down both sides of the road, looking off as far as my headlights allowed, looking for any eye shine. And that was when I saw it. The Red Rock, like most gas field roads, had an 80 to 100 meters of clear cut along the right side of the road to allow the laying in of a pipeline to carry the gas from the wells in the field to the plant. On this section of the Red Rock, the right of way was cleared of timber, but the tree stumps were still in place, which is the usual condition when the pipe has yet to be laid. The stumps were the gray brown of trees that had been dead for several years. Between the starlight, the headlights, and the snow, I could identify stumps and the bottom part of tree trunks of the standing timber at the back of the clear-cut right of way. Finishing the scan, I had looked forward down the road, and just when I was about to drive on, I caught a motion in my peripheral vision on the right, drawing my attention back to that area. At first, I thought it was just a tall stump, as it appeared a bit taller than another stump nearby. A slight breeze moved the fur or hair of this taller stump, and it sort of shimmered like the hollow tips on a grizzly's coat in the truck's headlights. Looking closer, I now see what appears to be a round head, no face visible, and two round shoulders. The width from outside shoulder to outside shoulder had to be at least three football helmets wide, at least one meter. The bulkiness of the shoulders should have been another clue that the shape of this form was not that of a bear. This, my aha moment, and I am now thinking I now know what was making the elk run. A bear, and by its coloring, a grizzly. I feel the puzzle has been solved satisfactorily, and start to move forward. That's when it stands up on two legs. When I say it stands, what it does is it unfolds in a smooth and easy motion. No swaying, no side to side in the way a bear does to keep in a standing position. I'm still thinking grizzly bear. Based on its estimated distance from the side of the road, about 10 to 12 meters, the brightness of the area being lit by the high beams and how the upper part of the standing form fades into darkness, I would guesstimate the height to be 7 to 8 feet. It turns its upper body towards the east, and even though I cannot see a face, I get the feeling it is looking further down the road in the direction I'm headed. I have the impression of a head, but it's tall enough that the upper third of the body fades into the darkness, that being only slightly a different dark than the standing timber several more meters behind the form. Think dark bluish-black for trees, and dark blackish-brown for the upper part of the creature. My next surprise is when it drops its arms. The left arm is long enough that I can see the range of motion, shape, and the large shape of a hand in the light of the high beams. This is why I say arms. It was a hand and not a paw. The arm was longer and the hand was lower than where a human hand would rest beside a human thigh. I'm beginning to be overwhelmed by a feeling of dis-ease like I should not be sitting still and that I really should start driving away from this creature. My heart is racing, my hair is on end, and I think, Oh my God! as I start carefully forward, half expecting to see another one step up to the road. It takes me a few minutes to think, but I believe I have just seen a Sasquatch. From the time I braked for the elk to the time I felt compelled to start driving was probably no more than 20 to 25 seconds. 2006, Highway 82 north between Joseph and Elgin, Oregon, off the side of the Wallowa Lake Highway. It was late summer of 2007. I was with my dad and we were helping my sister move. My dad is one of those real serious farmer types. We grew up our whole lives in Walla Walla, Washington, in the middle of wheat fields. My dad is one of the most honest and hardworking people I know. He is and always has been drug-free. He has always been a Bigfoot skeptic, and so I thought could detour his personal opinion. To my surprise, I was wrong. As he and I were sitting in his pickup, he very seriously looked at me and asked, Are you a believer in unnatural things? Of course, I live for this kind of thing. I told him yes, and with a very skeptical and slightly nervous face, he just looked at me. I have never seen my dad question or look confused about anything, ever. This is my dad. I believe in him. 
So he slowly pulls out his digital camera and just holds on to it as if to change his mind and forget he ever said anything. By this time, I can't sit still. I want to know what's got my dad acting this way. This isn't like him. I was 25 at the time, my dad, early 50s. After debating for about 10 minutes, he finally hands me his camera. Silence for what felt like forever. All I could muster up was a laugh and a snide comment as to what TV show did you find these on. There were two photographs on his camera. I have never, never in my life seen anything that looked like this. My dad had the most disappointed, upset, hurt face I have ever seen. Grabbed his camera and completely went silent. After almost an hour of pleading, he finally spoke to me. He just looked at me and said, Of all the people in the world, I believed you would understand. My heart sank. I was so intrigued that I continued the questions. I needed, I wanted to see and study those photos. After another hour of prodding, I finally got him to speak and finally got my trust back. It was shock that caused my reaction. And was it real? Was it? It couldn't be. Those two pictures in his camera forever changed me and anyone I ever shared with. The photographs are unlike anything I have seen or heard about. I get the same reaction when I share the pics. It brings a whole new look on life. Here's my dad's story. Spring 2006. At the time the photos were shot, my dad was a logging truck driver. He drove through very remote places in the forest. It was around 5.30 a.m., bright and clear outside. The sky was a beautiful light blue and the weather was calm. I was driving the back logging roads between Elgin and Joseph, Oregon, heading to pick up a log load. To let you know, I am in thousands of untouched acres of forest. Almost unimaginable. This was no man's land. After having drunk about a pot of coffee that morning, I needed to make a quick stop, pull over, and relieve myself there off the side of the road. There was no one around for miles and miles. In the process of relieving myself, I have this uncomfortable feeling of being watched. So I slowly looked up, and about three to four car lengths in front of me. I'm looking into the forest, truck to my back, and the door open. There, staring right at me, was the most massive, unnatural thing I have ever seen. I quickly cut my business off and began backing up and into my truck. I couldn't think. The hair was standing on end and confused. I continued to back up and then climbed into the cab of my truck. I locked the door and grabbed my pistol and camera. Either way, one was getting used. I looked back around at the creature. He was still there. This massively built, human-like creature, just staring. I never felt threatened, so I snapped a photo and watched in awe for almost a minute before it turned to walk away. I snapped another quick side shot of his face. He just continued to walk deeper into the forest at a calm and natural pace, never looking back. Then he was gone, and I realized I better get gone too. I never reported this at work or discussed it with my co-workers, and I've had a hard time telling you, my own daughter, a believer no less. A co-worker of mine reported a similar story six months after my experience. He lost his job and is considered crazy amongst family and friends, which is the whole reason I won't share my photos of what I saw. I'm going to describe the photos as best I can, but I cannot share them with you as that was part of the promise I made to my dad in order to get the copies that I have and completely cherish. Here goes. My dad is six foot one and about 200 pounds. The Sasquatch was around seven and a half to eight feet tall and 300 pounds easily. I'm looking at my copies so I can describe in detail. I want to remind you again that there are no photographs out there that I could find that look like this guy. The creature is dark in skin color, much like that of a gorilla. He is hairless on his face and neck. He has hair growth where any grown man does on his body. Almost identical pattern, but much thicker. Tops of the arms, back, chest, parts of the legs, groin area. He had muscle structure like that of a very fit mid-twenties man. His muscle definition is massive. Very defined and large leg and arm muscles, unlike any Bigfoot pictures I have seen. 
His face stares intently, studying, waiting, and ready. His arms are at his side, but not touching his body, ready for the next move. His face is stern, his lips are tight. His ears are small, and his forehead is large and slopes at an angle. His eyebrow structure is strong. They protrude out to protect the eye sockets. The eyes are dark and deep set. The nose is very small, and the area between his lip and nose is longer, protrudes out more, and is longer than the human area. He also has a scar that begins just above his eyebrow and ends below his bottom lip. A good war wound, for sure. His hair is long and begins halfway back, like a receding hairline, but natural. The hair is in dreadlocks and blends with the body hair, kind of mimicking a Tarzan suit. The hair is more a dark brown, reddish color and thicker and more coarse than human hair. The thing is, he isn't appalling or scary to look at. He's rather handsome for something of this nature. He looks like a hunter, a warrior, a guard. That's my dad's story. I hope to one day get over in the area and experience this for myself, but for now, I will continue to cherish my dad's photographs. Stacy Wright, Washington State, August 2012. Umatilla National Forest, Oregon, 2009. My name is Nicholas McCain. I grew up in Dixie, Washington, and am now 23 years of age. My story takes place about a year and a half ago. It was early August when my friends invited me to go camping for a weekend with them. The place was in the Umatilla National Forest and about three miles past Jubilee Lake. Motet Campgrounds is in Oregon. It's a beautiful area and plenty of places to go hiking. Later in the evening, after eating a great meal of venison and elk and moose, a friend brought, which may have very well helped to get their attention, on the last day. It was just my friends Jordan, Josh, and I still awake around the fire with a number of people sleeping around in their tents. I was resting on a cot about five feet away from the fire and about twenty feet away from the edge of the woods that the soon coming noise would come from. It was somewhere around 11.30 p.m. Jordan gets up from his chair and walks over to the edge of the tree line nearest me to relieve himself. In the middle of doing so, there was a sudden growling, snorting noise that came from about 15 yards into the trees. This was enough to cut off Jordan in midstream and run backwards back to the fire. Josh and I were on our feet within the blink of an eye, and without even realizing, I grabbed my knife off my side. All of us, pretty much at the same time, started looking at each other and started to question as to whether or not we all heard the same thing and what the could that have possibly been. We all grew up in a little town of Dixie, only a couple of miles from being right in the blues, and we were all well aware of what kind of animals to expect, having spent many nights in the mountains. We were not impaired in any way, having partied a little too hard the last few nights, and having to be up early to leave the next day. After about a minute, Jordan and I ran back to our tent to grab the machete and the big flashlight. We inspect the woods as best we can from about five feet in, after seeing nothing right away, we started smacking trees and yelling, basically making a hell of a racket in case it was a cougar or something. We figured whatever it was would run away if we made enough noise and whatnot. After doing that, we made the fire a bit bigger and made sure to have some branches sticking out just in case we had to throw them. We all calmed down after about 20 minutes or so and went back to regular chit-chat. An hour and 15 minutes goes by, when out of nowhere, and from the same exact spot we last heard the noise, we hear a roar and a sudden smashing of what sounds like large hammers on wood and tree branches violently snapping, and a thud, 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 and then complete silence. In about six thuds that we were able to hear, it traveled about 35 to 40 yards while this was happening, we all stood back and started screaming what the f what was that, so on and so forth, not willing to even go near the edge of the woods. One of the people sleeping in the tent nearest to everything comes bolting out, squealing her head off and freaking out, wanting to know what that was as well. This was enough to get the guy with the 44 out of bed and whatnot, but by that time there was nothing left really he could do. A good half hour goes by and he finally goes back to sleep 
as well as Casey, the one who was sleeping nearest to the ruckus, and the three of us go back to sitting around the fire. Twenty minutes later, we hear the sounds, like thud, 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 only further away in the distance and walking away. We at this point are exhausted and decide to go to sleep. It just so happens that we are all sleeping in a four-person tent, and it just so happens that the zipper on the door was broken, so it was flapping open all night and day long. When we awoke the next day, all three of us had about two to five pine cones around our heads. I know the door on the tent was broken, but there's just no damn way we all dragged in that many pine cones all the way by our heads. I found a very large footprint outside our tent, and when examining the area where all the noise had happened the night before, there were two 10-foot and 15-foot trees broken in two spots, as if something had grabbed it with two hands and bent it over with ease. This is the photo of the footprint. From here forward, I know that Bigfoot exists, and although that I was scared as I've ever been in my life, I must go back and search. One day, one of us who believe will get that proof we've all been searching for. Nick McCain Joe Bielhart's Bigfoot and Fishing A Little Story on the Tualatin River, Oregon An acquaintance of mine was having his house sighted four years ago. The crew was Mexican. On his desk in the study, he had a foot cast that I had taken up in the Clackamas. When one of the siders saw the cast, he became very excited. My friend doesn't understand Spanish, but the foreman told him that the man wanted him to see some pictures, to be at the house when they started work the next day. The man brought a packet of photographs he had taken along the lower Tualatin River, about 15 miles south of Portland, when he and friends were fishing for panfish, bass, and catfish. The river also has a huge population of crawfish. After looking at what the man offered, I was called and directed to come to my acquaintance's house now. The photographs included five or six of Bigfoot. There were two of them. One photograph was probably taken from about 15 feet or less away and showed a chest and headshot of the two Bigfoots. Through the translator, the man said he and his friends had seen them a couple of times over the weekend. Date of weekend was inconclusive, but it was sometime that summer. Translated, he said that they used a one-time camera to make the shots and that the creatures didn't seem to mind them being nearby, as long as they sort of ignored them. They thought the beasts were after crawfish from the snapping motions he demonstrated. Some of this discussion was while I wasn't there. We asked if we could make copies of the photographs. We were very excited. There was an animated discussion over the request in Spanish. It seemed as if the man didn't want his identity known. My acquaintance said he wasn't on the crew the next day. He took the photographs back. In a few months, the siding company closed, so my repeated quiet request to get in touch with him again had no luck. The photographs showed dark-faced, relatively short-haired creatures that were very muscular and trim. The big one was probably seven feet tall and the other about six and a half feet tall. Sex was indeterminate. Both creatures appeared to be in good health. The silhouetted photo of the one drinking, probably the smaller one, again showed a trim but big body. Almost across the Tualatin River where the photographs were made, Steve Kiley and I investigated a sighting report the previous year. The subject is on film. The description was the same, time was night, duration about 15 to 20 seconds under a yard light before the 17-year-old got scared and roused his parents. About one mile downstream is a monastery of some type that reportedly maintains a number of monkeys on the premises. Also, our theory is that the Tualatin River is a natural pathway for the creatures between the coastal mountain range and the Cascade Mountains. So, once again, some possible proof, but nothing. All I have is some detailed notes in my log. My best, Joe Bealhart, West Lynn, Oregon, Friday the 17th of November, 2006. Thompson's Flat, Sixes River, Oregon. Stan Sweet, a teacher in North Bend, Oregon, 
wrote to ask if there were any recent reports around a place called Thompson Flat on the Sixes River on Oregon's south coast. This is a very remote spot between Powers, Myrtle Point, and Sixes, Oregon. According to local legend, the place was a mining town in the 1800s, but the inhabitants were terrorized by a wild man. Slowly, the townspeople left the remote site, not wanting to deal with the strange hairy creatures living there. Until quite recently, an old prospector lived there. I had a chance to speak with him once, and he described seeing a creature fitting the Bigfoot description on a number of occasions. Stan Sweet The Coos Bay Historical Society has a couple of documents containing information on the Bigfoot that terrorized the Thompson Flat area. In the old days, after all the miners had been run off by the wild man, one brave miner decided to stay. Some time later, they found him at a sluice box with his head bashed in by a bloody rock, which was still lying nearby. At the time, the old miner was the only living soul in the area. Source, Stan Sweet, Personal Correspondence. Hood River County, Oregon, Wadham Lake, 1980. My girlfriend and I arrived at Wadham Lake early one evening. After parking, we hiked down a forested trail to the lake, which sits in a valley three or four hundred feet below the road. On the trail down, we had passed several campsites with young, noisy campers drinking and playing boomboxes. The lake is surrounded by forest and thick brush. A trail circled the lake through the thick brush with clearings every couple hundred feet, each with a fire ring for camping. We followed that trail to the opposite side of the lake, where there were no campers, found a clearing, and set up camp. We were dismayed when sometime after dark, another group of young campers arrived at the next clearing, about a hundred yards down the trail, and set up camp. They began to drink and carry on, playing music until close to midnight. When they finally quieted down, we were able to crawl into our dome tent and go to sleep. Some time later, I was awakened by very heavy footfalls coming down the trail towards our camp. As I lay there on a thin mat, I could actually feel ground tremors as this thing got closer. Wide awake and quite alarmed, I laid there unmoving and listening as the footfall suddenly became much lighter, as if it was walking on tiptoes, yet it was just outside the tent. We had some dishes soaking in the lake, maybe 20 feet away, and I heard them clinking as if something was messing with them. I then heard it as it headed down the trail in the opposite direction from which it had come, this time heading toward the campsite occupied by the noisy teenagers. Once again, the footfalls seemed to get heavier as they receded in the distance. Five or ten minutes later, we heard a young girl scream, followed by men yelling, all coming from the campsite where the teenagers were. It soon quieted down and we went to sleep. I awoke at dawn, made coffee, and headed down the trail to the teenager's campsite to ask them about their nighttime visitor, only to find their campsite empty. They must have left real early. While sleeping in the open on the shore of Green Lake in the Three Sisters Wilderness, I once had a herd of elk approach to within a few feet to drink from the lake. I sat up and they scattered in every direction. What we heard at Wadham Lake was different, definitely walking on two legs. It was either a very heavy person or... Paul Holbrook Sweet Home, Lynn County, Oregon, October 1st, 2010 My name is Andy Robson and I'm a private Sasquatch experiencer. I live in the Northwest Oregon to be exact. This event took place in Sweet Home, Oregon. My grandfather saw it in British Columbia in 1958. The truth is, I never thought I would have an experience. The sighting was in 2010, first day of October, I believe. I know it is in Lynn County. It was late summer, late September, early October. I walked out on the porch to breathe some fresh air when I noticed something to the right of me. I turned and saw a seven-foot-tall gray Sasquatch standing about 50 to 75 feet away. It walked away slowly, making only heavy breathing sounds. I heard the footsteps, but they were not as loud as I expected them to be. Then suddenly, I heard nothing at all. He was gone. 
I was quite shaken. The whole event only lasted five to seven seconds, but it was very real and very intense. I found footprints around the area, and there are still reports coming from this remote area in the hills of Sweet Home, Lynn County, Oregon. Sweet Home is a small town near Eugene and Albany. I noticed that the Sasquatch were thinner than most. It was not bulky or muscular at all. It looked like a tall, hairy, thin male. It had deep breaths. I heard him breathing 50 to 75 feet away. All I can remember is that it was tall, light gray, shadowy, and moved with no intention of being scared that I was there. He just walked off, slowly and into the forest. My grandfather's sighting was published in John Green's The Sasquatch File in British Columbia, and that was in December of 1958 in the Bella Coola Valley. My grandfather, George Robson, saw a Sasquatch with his friend Bert while they were camping around a fire. They were hunting by Burnt Bridge at the time when a tall eight-foot Sasquatch, black hair, came down and stood looking at them. When they stared back, the creature leapt, jumping over patches of snow to remain hidden. They found one heel print, but nothing else. It just vanished into the forest. He died when I was nine years old, and I have always wanted to go back there and investigate. My grandfather was a great man. Andy. Lane County, Oregon, near Cascade Summit, 1988, Diamond Peak Wilderness. My partner and I were deer hunting near the Diamond Peak Wilderness area, south of Highway 58, near the Cascade Summit in Oregon. It was the second weekend of the season, 1988. We had a small travel trailer to stay in. We arrived at our camp spot almost at midnight on Friday. It was about 2 a.m. when we finally got settled down and hit the sack. My partner was asleep almost immediately as I could hear him snore lightly every once in a while. Even though I was dog dead tired, my head was going a hundred miles per hour after the long day we had. As I was lying there thinking about what I might have forgotten, I heard in the distance a thumping noise. It came from the south of us toward the wilderness area. At first I thought it might be some other hunter setting up camp, but I heard no other noises. It was a strange sound like dropping a heavy object onto hard ground. It finally faded out and I went to sleep. The next morning we drove down the road we had come in on and stopped by a small creek. My partner had done some scouting in this area some time before and said this should be a good place to hunt. With only about three hours of sleep, I didn't care and said, okay. We split up with about 30 yards between us as we worked our way down the creek, losing sight of each other occasionally because of the brush. After about two hours, I lost sight of him for quite some time and began to call his name in a very low tone. I did not get an answer from him, so I started looking around. After a short time, I found him sound asleep against a tree stump with his rifle across his legs. As tired as we were, I couldn't really blame him and decided to wander around on my own for a little while. I followed the creek on down for about another hour when the brush became too dense I could go no further. I made a hard left turn and after about 30 yards came to a dirt bank about 10 feet high. It was pretty steep and as I approached it, I saw some depressions going up it. I went up beside them but really didn't pay much attention until I got to the top. The last depression was not just a depression but also a footprint or about a half a footprint from the toes to the ball of the foot. It was huge, about seven and a half inches across at the widest point. It was also clear enough to tell which foot. It was the right one. It also had five toes. I pondered for a moment and then looked for more prints, but the brush was too thick. I wondered why only half a print, and then it dawned on me. When you go up a steep bank, you don't walk on the whole foot. You use the toes and the ball of the foot, as if you were taking steps. I did not have a camera with me at the time, and the only other thing I remember is that it was about two and a half times deeper than my prints, and I weighed 200 pounds. Realizing how late it was getting, I started back for my partner, who was still asleep when I arrived. I woke him up, and we headed back to our vehicle. I never told him, because he's a non-believer, and told me some years before that he did not believe in that BS. Nothing else happened the rest of our time there. I have never been back to that spot since, 
but would like to go someday. A few years later, I read in the local paper that some hunters in that same area reported hearing strange screams late in the day. Make of it what you will. Please, no name, no nothing. Lane County, Oregon, 2008. Labor Day weekend. This is my wife's Bigfoot experience. My name is Jesse, and my wife's name is Victoria. Just to get it straight up front, I am the Bigfoot lover, meaning I'm the one who is fascinated by the big guy. My wife, I know, just humors me when I talk about him, so to say she believes, but has not done any type of research. She just goes on what I tell her, and even then she does not really pay attention. Well, it was this past Labor Day weekend in 2008 that this experience developed. Me and my family live on the coast in Florence, Oregon, in Lane County. As everybody knows, this weekend is usually a very busy holiday for campers and outgoing people, so we figured that our favorite camping spot would be taken, so we didn't plan to even pack up to go camping. That Saturday, me, my wife, and my two children decided to go to our favorite spot to do some blackberry picking. We drove the 30-some miles to the town called Swiss Home, Oregon. This is also still in Lane County. It was only three more miles to our favorite spot. I'm still relatively new to the state and don't know the name of the river that we go to, but I'm sure if you look up the area on a map, you'll find it. Anyway, when we went there, we were surprised that the whole area was empty except for a few RVs that were parked about two blocks from our usual camping spot. The layout of the area is very beautiful. It is heavily wooded and has mountains all around. Our favorite camping spot is just off of Highway 36. It's more like a large picnic area that's off the side of the road and down about two or three blocks. Anyway, we drove to a spot that's close to the river so the kids could go swimming and me and my wife could just sit and relax. Because the place was empty, me and the wife decided that me and my son should go back to town and get the tent and some overnight stuff and bring it back so we could spend at least one night. So me and my son did just that. About two hours later we returned, and this is what my wife told me. First she told me that the park ranger stopped by about ten minutes after we left and made her put out the fire that we built, and said that there was a ban on. That explains why most of the campground spots were empty. So my wife did what she was told. About twenty minutes after he left, my wife and my daughter went and picked some berries. My daughter was just playing around and she decided to pick up a stick and started to bang on a tree. As my wife told me this, I started to chuckle. She looked at me kind of irritated, and I told her to keep on telling me what happened. She continued to tell me, not long after my 14-year-old stopped knocking with the sticks, she heard a very weird scream come from across the river. By now, I started to laugh. She told me she knew that it wasn't a human, and she never heard a bird make that sound. She then told me that rocks started to splash in the middle of the river so I told her to show me where she saw the rocks land. She did so, and said that she saw the rocks fall from the sky and land. She said that these rocks were about softball size. As I looked from across the river, I realized that the incline on the other side was too steep for humans to stand there and throw rocks without losing their balance. I mentioned this to her, and that's when she told me she thought about that also, and she started to look for someone doing this and saw no one. I then started to laugh and said how she never really listens to me. She got kind of mad and asked why I say that. I told her that she just had a classic Bigfoot experience. She then said, well, she was not going to sleep there if we couldn't have a fire, and made us pack up all the stuff and head home. This was our experience of the summer. Jesse and Vicky. Willamette National Forest Salt Creek Falls, Lane County, Oregon, 1975. This happened 30 years ago at age 5. While camping with my sister and parents at Salt Creek Falls, Oregon, on Highway 58, just past the tunnel, a large being sat down in our campsite and ate some chicken out of the bucket we'd left out. This was in the middle of the night. My parents were sleeping in a nearby tent, and my sister and I were on cots out in the open, as I said, I was five years old and my sister was ten. The next morning, my sister and I were out exploring and playing on the lava flows. Something scared my sister and she pushed me down and ran. 
I suffered a gash to the side of my head. Someone or something picked me up and carried me like a baby. He or it carried me back to the campsite and placed me on my cot. My parents weren't there, and when they came back from looking for me, they asked me how I found my way back. I told them a bear carried me back. I told them that he or it walked, carrying me on its arms. I remember that it was all hairy and wore no clothes. It looked like the same thing that was eating the chicken the night before. Haven't seen anything like this since. I leave it to you, but looking back, I think it was a Bigfoot. Maybe it would be worthwhile to check out the area for other sightings. Thanks, Jana M. Thanks for listening. If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email me, Lynn Smith, at BigfootCaseFiles at mail.com. I'm looking forward to hearing from you.